and we'll start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. Order. This is the Digital Culture Media and Sports Select Committee. This is a special uh, session that we have today on EU visa arrangements for creative workers. Uh, before I introduce the witnesses, and then also I wish to make a, a personal statement before we move to our first question, uh, I'm going to uh, just ask for the committee to see whether there's any uh, interest to declare. Alex Davis Jones. Thank you, Chair. I would like to declare that I am a member of the Musicians Union. Thank you. Kevin Brennan. Uh, uh, yes, thank you, Chair. I'm a member of the Musicians Union and re received support from them at the last election. Thank you. We're joined by three witnesses today uh, Tamara Jinjik, founder and chief executive of Fashion Roundtable, Noel McLean, National Secretary, Arts and Entertainment, BBC and Independent Broadcasting Divisions, Broadcasting, Entertainment, Communications and the Theatre Union. Back to, in other words. I'm sorry, I had to take a breath halfway through there. It was quite a long job title. Uh, Craig Stanley, Agent and Promoter, Marshall Arts Limited and Chair of the Touring Group Live. Tamara, Noel and Craig, good afternoon and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you're very kind to have actually agreed to, uh, to come in at relatively short notice. The reasons why uh, that we aren't uh, have a more extensive session today is because, unfortunately, uh, the uh, Lord Frost, the uh, Minister of State of the Cabinet Office, uh, decided to uh, withdraw uh, earlier this week. Uh, I would make a statement to say that the DCMS Select Committee has had considerable difficulty securing any time with the Minister of State at the Cabinet Office, Lord Frost. We were told on the 16th of February in this committee by Caroline Dynage, MP, it was his responsibility to oversee the negotiation of crucial bilateral agreements to ensure that people working in the creative and service sectors in the UK can travel to and work in countries within the EU. Following our subsequent request to the Minister, Lord Frost, we had two refusals, point blank, to appear. It was only after that I tackled the Prime Minister in liaison committee, where he confirmed that it was Lord Frost's job to oversee this matter, that he stated that Lord Frost should appear before this committee, that finally, on April the 23rd, more than two months after we initially heard that it was his responsibility, we secured a date for the Minister's appearance, that being today, you can imagine my dismay, and the committee's dismay, at the said Minister's subsequent cancellation of his appearance this week. We all appreciate, as parliamentarians, that there are many important issues for the Minister to address, particularly in the light of the trade disagreement between the EU and the UK in the run-up to the G7. However, the Minister, citing as he did at the time, the G7 as a reason for cancellation, raises more than one or two eyebrows, as it could hardly be deemed an unexpected event. Parliamentary scrutiny in front of select committees is of crucial importance in our democratic system and is particularly important I think when we have a government with a majority of over 80. It is even brought into an even sharper focus when the government chooses to appoint members of the House of Lords to Cabinet. The truth of the matter is that ministers in Cabinet from the Commons have scrutiny due to questions, urgent statements and uh, departmental uh, questions. They are accountable every day. It isn't acceptable for Lords not to be accountable when they hold high office. And I and this committee look forward to Lord Frost joining us at the rearranged date and we will not truck any further cancellation. Thank you. So, uh, I'm sorry, Tamara, uh, Noel and, and Craig there for that very long statement, but, but Craig, um, I saw you sort of nodding away there during the, my, my uh, diatribe. What's your sort of thinking in terms of that as someone who's on the front line with this, with the fact that we've not had the appearance from Lord Frost today? 
Well, we're very frustrated, the whole sector. And I'm here for Live, which represents 3, 000, over 3,000 businesses, trade associations, promoters, agents, and effectively the entire live contemporary music industry. And we also have embraced the work of those in the classical world as well. So for him not to turn up is extremely disappointing because the pressing issues of musicians that are entourages to be able to move and continue to work freely around Europe is an existential threat to our entire industry. For us not to be able to understand, let alone find ways to cut through the red tape that is now going to be hindering us as we return back after COVID to tour in Europe. And lastly, not to actually be able to hear his comments, Lord Frost's comments, on the proposal of, of a support package that can help us in this transition as we have our new arrangements with Europe. Thank you. No so it's deeply frustrating. Thank you. We share that frustration, believe me. Uh, Nolan, tomorrow, any comments to add in, in that respect? No? Yeah, can I, can I just add to that? To, uh, first of all, to thank you and to uh, actually welcome uh, the comments you made, Chair, rather than uh, apologise for them. Um, delighted to be here, of course, but I, uh, in a funny way, uh, I wish I was not. We were, and I remember, we were looking forward to seeing Lord Frost uh, appear. We are looking forward to the Select Committee to questioning him um, in the very diligent way that they've conducted their work so far on this issue and many other issues that affect our members. Uh, so our disappointment uh, is in incredibly deep also. Can I also add though that it's just, I think we have to view it in the round with everything else that has been promised and has not happened over the course of the last few months uh, since the TCA was agreed. You know, various ministers promising that they're working uh, very hard, that it's top of their inbox. The prime minister saying that he's working flat out to fix it. Repeated promises that they are working very hard and we will see the results of that very, very soon. And this just coming on top of that just adds to the, the, very, uh, the very reasonable feeling, I have to say, that our members have, which is at a government level, as opposed to uh, one of our members here today in the select committee, at government level, in terms of their issue and their industry and their jobs, senior government either doesn't get it or doesn't care. And I'm afraid today's non-appearance just simply adds to that and validates it more. So deeply disappointing, Chair, I have to say. Thank you. Uh, Tamara, I saw you nodding. And also, uh, if you'd like to reflect on the statements there from uh, Noel and Craig, but also maybe perhaps you could just outline for the committee the particular challenges faced by the fashion industry, which is an enormous revenue earner for the UK and in normal times is a, is a real sort of bright light in our economic landscape. Tamara. Thank you, Chair. So. Um, this is a very valuable committee, and I think if someone felt they had all their ducks in a row and were prepped for it, they wouldn't cancel at the short notice. So it would suggest that they either don't, they don't want to come under your scrutiny or they're not prepped. Um, either way, it's um, several months into the realities of Brexit, and these are realities that just in, um, are obviously added to by the pandemic. So obviously normal travel and normal engagements aren't at the stages that they would have been ordinarily post Brexit, where I think we would have seen these things in sharper focus. But that notwithstanding, it is obviously disappointing that the, um, the government's leadership on the Brexit negotiations has cancelled um, and hasn't engaged. And I think it's a lack of engagement that is the more, most troubling aspect of this. Um, the fashion industry, is the largest of the creative industries and where it straddles, I think, and this is also part of the issue that I want to come on to later is, um, it straddles DCMS, but also other departments, including Bayes, obviously, and immigration with the Home Office. Um, and so it's seen in very many silos when I'm engaging with civil servants, we have to defer to different departments. Um, and I think that once we're out of all of this uh, uh, an addressing of, of how business is approached and how the creative industries is approached um, and a lack of siloing would be really for really really helpful we have issues of goods 
which is not the, the perhaps the topic of today's conversation, but we also obviously have the issues of services, i.e. talent getting in and out. And that means not only the approximately around 50% of EU workers that work in the top end of the higher ends of the creative industries, as well as the garment workers who are perceived at the lower end, but I would actually argue are highly qualified, if not always highly paid. Um, who don't meet the requirements of the shortage occupation list, but equally for our talent um, who, by working on a global stage, including with our closest partners in the EU, um, add reputation and value, all of which they obviously might be working in the EU, but they're paying their taxes here, which is lucrative to um, HMRC. So any shortfall on that is, is problematic, either in terms of relocation or potential damages to their businesses. So that's very worrying. Tamara, just to, to press home on one point there, uh, effectively your industry and the other industries that are represented today have endured a, a no-deal Brexit. Uh, there's been a deal, but it's the service sector effectively and the movement of people has been left out of that deal. Um, are the concerns that you have, are they exacerbated by problems in the industry, such as low pay uh, and the potential for exploitation? Well, when the... Um Leicester scandal hit the news in, in the summer, I did ask the MAC, the Migration Advisory Committee, whether they had done an impact assessment on potential exploitation by not adding garment workers to the shortage occupation list. And they said they had not. And for me, that is a perfect storm because what we've seen since the pandemic is um, Make It British have quoted to me, which is a is an organisation that supports British manufacturing, which I support, by the way, I support the concept of onshoring and a levelling up agenda. But they've seen an 83% in, in requests to onshore from small and, and larger, in, larger in, um, sector leaders. Um, which is to be encouraged, but there are massive gaps they, that can't be filled in almost every factory that we've spoken to. And if you don't have these garment workers on the shortage occupation list, and you're offering them currently a three month visa, which quite frankly is insulting to a Lithuanian woman who's probably in a family and got kids and, um, and responsibilities, then you are definitely potentially looking at exploitation as, a, as, a, as an unforeseen outcome by not having them on the garment shortage, uh, on the shortage occupation list. And as well, we haven't set up the T levels um, until September 23, which would um, support uh, domicile talent going into those jobs. So it's kind of a perfect storm example to me of where different departments are in charge of something, but no one's seen it in the round as an issue. Yeah, uh, that's a familiar tale. Um, does that mean therefore you're saying that there'll be more likely to be more Leicester scandals without this issue being sorted out in a way it is a it is a concern for me with businesses quite quite rightly wanting to bring business back to the UK because of the pandemic um, and the issues with the um, conflict the issues raising with the Uyghurs and dealing with China and other areas where there's definitely higher rates of MSA in the supply chain I don't I'm not saying that every business I spoke to Boohoo yesterday and they say they tell me they are tackling this in their supply chain um, obviously as a large online retailer um, as much as possible and they've brought in um, Leveson to, to, do, to tackle that with KPMG but at the same time I think that if you don't if you don't square this in the round if you don't deal with the aspect of not having these workers because of some ideology about high wages and not address that actually 22,000 earned out of London is not a bad wage for somebody who's in a family where the husband's earning um, and, and, and putting a limit on the wage rather than actually on the jobs, I think is problematic. So if, you're going, if you want to support onshoring, which I believe the government does, then you have to either speed up the T levels so that we've got the domicile talent supply chain or at least allow the workers in until they've graduated. Right, thank you. Uh, Craig, what have been the consequences or what do you foresee as the consequences over the next year, the year after, uh, of the lack of ability for your members uh, to, to travel freely to the EU and to also move their uh, equipment and, and other goods. You're muted, Craig. Chair, I'd be more than happy to, to answer that, but I feel that a musician is probably best placed to, to answer that, which I'm not. But unlike this committee, I actually met with Lord Frost. I met for him for an hour on the 27th of April in the company of Sir Alan John and David Furnish, CEO of Rock Entertainment. On hearing that I was appearing here, 
today, Sir Elton wrote the following, which he would, would he has asked me to read out to the committee. His opinion about the future is, this is the gravest situ of situations. It is about to damage the next generations of musicians and emerging artists whose careers will stall before they've even started due to this infuriating blame game. If I had faced the financial and logistical obstacles facing young musicians now, when I started, I'd never have had the opportunity to build the foundations of my career. And I very much doubt I would be where I am today. I call on the government to sort this mess out. Or we risk losing future generations of world beating talent. It's a very powerful statement. Um, do you have any extra sort of uh, reflections on that? I mean, the, I mean, it very much speaks for itself. But in terms of your oh. your members, live music is a very broad church. It ranges from the self-employed single musician, violinist, going to do a single gig or recording in France at very short notice, to, to Coldplay, perhaps going out with two hundred people on the road and fifty trucks, and everything in between. I'm concerned for the musicians, and so often the question is framed within how will it impact musicians. I'm equally concerned of all the behind the scenes stuff. For every musician who's on stage, there might be 10, 20, 50, perhaps 100 people to get him or her there. And it's that loss. You know, I was talking to a lighting company, or a couple of lighting companies this week. One is already considering at least a 30, 40% reduction in their income when we return after COVID. Another one, which is a major, it's one of the largest in, in operating on this side of the Atlantic, is, is contemplating moving 75% of their stock offshore into European depots. This means that then staff who would normally be UK based and will no longer be employed. We're starting to see uh, adverts for shows where they want crew and they say non EU nationals need not apply. And that's, that's just aimed at British staff who are being excluded. So I think there's this whole drain of talent going away from the industry. There's a whole drain of emerging talent which will not actually have the ability to grow and nurture. You know, it goes without saying that it's in our culture that the Beatles had to go to Hamburg to become a band. That's still true today. It's not about as such Brexit, I mean, I think we've all heard the arguments done to death as such. So we're not, it's not about backwards looking, is it, Craig? It's more about, frankly, the here and now. And do you believe that these matters are resolvable through bilateral arrangements? And do you, are you, what is your feedback in terms of our partners in, in, within the EU, in terms of what they would, uh, would they welcome our approach to try and get these matters sorted? Well, I, I've been invited and I've sat on the Cultural Working Group, chaired by Caroline Dianich, who uh, sadly has not actually attended the last two meetings, even though she's the chair. In that group, there's various subgroups, and I'm working in very closely. It's very welcome that DCMS have actually been really helpful to, and, and very supportive in many ways. They're suggesting bilateral arrangements. They say that they've, they've entered into them. We have no evidence of such. Two of my colleagues actually attended at the Spanish consulate this morning to talk about the issues, particularly with Spain. And the gentleman that they saw there acknowledged there had been some conversation, but not in any huge detail. And we're a bit sad, we're well, very sad that after five months, the no progress has been made on bilaterals to do with work arrangements. On cabotage, it is a very much more complicated issue. Mm. Because on one level, the DFT, which again have been most welcome, we've found most welcoming to actually work with us. They again have no power to actually drive anything through. They keep going back to Lord Frost's department to drive these measures through. Now, whether there are some solutions and workarounds, which are temporary, but we call actually on an EU-wide cultural exemption for trucks. Mm. For about five, 600 trucks is what it is, bearing in mind that the national fleet is over half a million. Mm. Craig, Trucks, I think I think what you're, the picture you're painting is of, of, of paralysis. It's as you say, it's it's sort of not me governing and having talking shops and round tables, 
but no one actually rolling up the sleeves and getting on with the job of having making the, the, the deals, so to speak, the bilateral arrangements that need to happen. I think, I know you're putting words in my mouth, but I would agree with every one of them. It is. We've, we've given the runaround. At these meetings with, of the Cultural Working Group, we've had five or six different departments presenting to us. And each of them then, I'll go, ah, yes, but, and then point in the other direction. Mm -hmm. The DCMS have also relied on a big fanfare about producing guidance. If I'm being candid, it's not guidance, it's been signposting. All they've done is employ Deloitte to actually do a trawl through all the available information online and put it on the government website and say, look there, there's guidance. The trouble is with that signposting is that quite a few sites lead us to dead ends. Mm. So we as an industry, we published it live. We published our first guide, first initial guide to the new arrangements of visas in February. The ISM have done some sterling work producing guides, which a lot of people are referencing. Now, we are volunteering to do this, we're unpaid. We feel it is the government's role and responsibility and obligation to our industry and to the fans and to the musicians and all those touched by music, which I believe is everyone in this country, to actually sort this out. They're just passing the buck and it's going round and round and it is getting very, very frustrating. Thank you. Noel, I can see you're um, uh, tensing up to come in there. Do you, in terms of your union, you represent a number of creative sectors. Which have been the most effective? And is the experience that Craig has just outlined one that's familiar to you? Sorry, just repeat that last bit, Chair. Yeah? I'm sorry. I was saying, is the experience that Craig has outlined, is that familiar to you? And which of the sectors that you represent are in line to be the most affected? Uh, I would agree wholeheartedly with the comments. Uh, uh, that Craig had just had just made. Um, I won't I won't repeat them. Um, uh, in terms of which bit of the sector, that's a that's a difficult question. I think there's a there's an immediate impact and there's a kind of longer term impact. And I'll just explain that in a way. So it's it's well documented. And the committee are well aware that, of course, uh, the, the the issues caused by the TCA or the or the kind of deficiencies of the, of the uh, TCA have been kind of masked uh, by the COVID crisis. I mean, people can't tour at the moment, not because of the TCA, but because of the various restrictions uh, in various jurisdictions uh, because of the global pandemic. Um, but as people are beginning to now start to plan beyond that, we are starting to see uh, the impact of the TCA uh, rather than because this is hopefully, I mean, being well, this is kind of uh, in the post kind of COVID uh, environment. but. So short term, in the live music um, and live entertainment sector, we are starting to hear, because many of our people, because of what they do, backstage uh, technicians, engineers, um, and kind of uh, support uh, crew and staff, because they work very closely in music, work very closely with bands, it's a fairly informal kind of world, it's a very informal environment. Uh, and there's many conversations about how if the bands can find a way over these hurdles, then that might be something. But they're saying to our people, we're not sure we can take you with us. And we might have to end relationships that we've had for a very long time with some very famous acts. Uh, these people are well regarded. And it's probably worth just mentioning and making the point that although our people in the main aren't seen, what they produce is, you know, most of our members who work in the live entertainment sector, it is their job and they do extremely well. It is their job, it is their job to take uh, an artistic vision and make it real. They, they make that vision a reality for people to pay money and uh, to experience uh, and uh, kind of enjoy. Uh, so there's lots of informal kind of uh, uh, arrangements there, lots of informal kind of relationships but many of them are telling us, it's been reported that they, they don't have a future uh, in terms of European touring uh, going forward. And you can see evidence of that in the more formal areas. So the more kind of corporate areas, and Craig touched on this. So there are more formal areas where job adverts go out and there's proper contracts and that kind of stuff. And we have seen uh, a few examples now. Uh, so, um, mainly holiday camps and cruise ships and that kind of thing where there's a need for audiovisual uh, technology 
And these are adverts with .co.uk email addresses. They're adverts from uh, organizations that are well known in the UK, and they are explicitly saying, we're looking for non-UK passport holders at this moment in time, or non-UK passport holders uh, need not, uh, UK passport holders need not apply. They, they are being explicit and we've been sent those adverts, I've got them on my file. So, so we're seeing that. Um, in the touring theatre sector, um, we're starting to see it as well. So um, I speak fairly frequently to organisations like the National Theatre and the Royal Opera House. And, you know, so when you're talking about a large scale touring theatrical performance, you are looking at minimum 18 months out in terms of planning. You, you are looking, so anything they're thinking about now is reasonably optimistically, but reasonably realistic as well, post COVID. Uh, and they are planning to not tour within the EU. Mm. That, that is the reality of it. So look at the National Theatre, um, and you look back, look at the history, look at what they've done, and look mm. what they've done for the UK overseas. So something like War Horse, yeah? Incredible production, and the soft power that that brings uh, as it kind of tours the world. Now, they did go to the EU in the previous tour, 2013, 14, I think, um, but to put this into some context, 90 days out of 180, Warhorse spent four months in Amsterdam alone. So, and it went to five further cities within the Netherlands. Then it went to Germany. So 90 days out of 180 is, is just not going to do it. They've shelved plans to tour their latest production, uh, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Night. There are no plans to tour the EU uh, with that, and there were previously plans. And I understand that in the past, Warhorse, when it toured in the EU, was done on a kind of licensed production basis. So it was done in the language of the host nation with local staff and crew. The plan for the 24-25 world tour, which was bigger than the previous tour, with Warhorse, is to spend a minimum of 30 weeks uh, in the EU. And the plan was to do that on an entirely different basis so it'd be UK production, UK language, using UK staff, the cast and the crew. And that is all now in doubt because of these uh, current regulations. So to put that into some kind of context, what, were that tour to be happening this year, it would have been cancelled. And were it happening next year, it would have been cancelled. So I hope that explains, Chair, there's a, there's a kind of very kind of impact. Um, Right, yes, it's got, as you say, it has a very long tail to it as well, uh, and, and, and decisions made now will have an impact in 23, 24, and 20, sorry, 22, 23, 24. Um, Alex davis Jones. Thank you, Chair, and can I echo your comments on Lord Frost as well, for the record, and can I um, extend my thanks to the witnesses for joining us at such short notice today. We really do appreciate you giving your testimony, and it has been incredibly powerful so far. Um, you've outlined um, in great detail so the impacts that this is having on your industries. But if I could ask you each in turn, please, Craig, coming to you first. You mentioned that there's been a lot of talking shops and a lot of action. What do you see as the priority area for the government that needs to be addressed on the EU visa arrangements for creative workers to be able to move freely around the EU? Well, first of all, I, and, and I'll, I'll come back to the visas, there's many other areas that also need immediate attention. Um, and uh, I think it'd be worthwhile the committee to, to consider all those other elements as well. I'm more than happy to provide uh, more detail on that. On the visas, we broadly agree with the Secretary of State where he announced just recently that perhaps 17, 18 of the 27 member states are fairly straightforward for short-term working. It doesn't get over the issue that Noel's outlined, the longer-term theatrical uh, performances. So immediately, in an open way, and embrace with the industry, because dare I say it, we are the experts, to actually enter into bilateral discussions with our counterparts in Europe and find a solution for those territories where there would appear to be difficulties. And I would particularly highlight, obviously, Spain is much in the news, Croatia, which is incredibly important to the DJ market, into the festival market, Bulgaria, 
this great uncertainty over Italy, Malta, I can provide a list of where we think they would be. And indeed, I have done so at the Cultural Working Group. But we've had no evidence of actually what that engagement is. Well, do, do you feel like the government is treating this as a priority? I think some of the officials are. My suspicion is that it would work much better if there was more senior involvement, more regularly involved with the plight of our industry. Okay, thank you. Because as Noel actually outlined, even though we're not working at the moment, it's very easy to say, oh, well, they're not really actively engaged because we can't work because of COVID restrictions. But we plan, even the smallest store is planning three, four months ahead. I'm booking shows into 23. Yeah. Now I'm having to guess what is happening. And I'm very fortunate some of our tours are very substantial. And this is substantial financial risk and having to make judgments on complete lack of information. If there was clarity, consistency, accuracy and accessibility of information, that would greatly help to ameliorate the anxieties across our industry. It wouldn't solve them, but it would reduce them considerably. Thank you. So are they actively involved? actively engaged, it needs to be at Lord Frost's level. And we did welcome that it was mentioned as a single line right at the end of the government uh, press release yesterday about the first partnership council meeting. Okay. But what's interesting is that the Secretary of State in February met with us and, and actually pointed to the partnership council as possibly a way forward. We were very surprised it's taken nearly five months before the first meeting. And we're a little byline at the bottom of it. We didn't appear on the agenda. Thank you. Tamara, for your industry, for the, for the fashion industry, do you feel like the government is taking the priority areas for you seriously? And what, what do you think should be a priority for the government in order to tackle some of the issues that your industry is facing? So, thank you. So, the, um, there was guidance, I think, last week to fashion prof professionals saying how to check um, domestic immigration rules and saying that there probably won't be checks on carnets. So, kind of like you don't really need to worry about it. But the reality that as ISM, who again, I've been part of their Free Move Create campaign for a number of years now and are fantastic at briefings. Um, I err on the side of caution and of course carnets cost and the people that this is going to put to risk are primarily your freelancer economy so as with music you've obviously got the big fashion stars who are you know organizing large fashion shows but the majority of the fashion professionals so the creatives who work whether that's on trade or fashion shows or on commercial shoots or editorial shoots are freelancers whether that's models or stylists hair and makeup or the brands themselves these are your sme community these are not wealthy people um, and for instance when you look at um, each of the of the countries you follow the links that have been set out by DCMS and you go to Austria and it says you need to apply to the Austrian embassy. It's not clear how long it will take to get the work permit. And then you look up um, Annex Servant for of the TCA if your role is included. And, one of the, and it says, have you got a degree? Loads of fashion people haven't got a degree. Um, professional qualifications required for your trade. How do you how do you quantify a professional qualification for a stylist? And six years relevant professional experience. So the guidance on each of these countries varies. The paperwork varies. This is a just in time business model. Mm -hmm. If you want to have a whole discussion about the nature of capitalism and how we've ended up in a just in time model, that's a whole other discussion. But the business and the industry works on a just in time business model. You will be booked. 50% of your bookings will come last minute. So basically, as of December, the UK is out of the EU business economy. So people are either looking to locate, which is obviously problematic in a pandemic, um, or trying to make enough money here, which they can't. There is just not enough work here because we are such a high ranking high caliber we are one of the we punch above our weight as a creative sector in the fashion industry there just isn't enough work for the talent that we've got so, so would, that's why we're a global export exactly exactly so what would be your ideal solution to the to this issue 
My ideal solution would be, in terms of this issue, would be a visa waiver and then a, a reduction in this paperwork an end to carnets, they are not fit for purpose because now you've got a system where if you go with the clothes on the Eurostar, it looks like you won't get stopped. But have you ever taken on an EU uh, customs official? It's very daunting, especially for a freelancer. And I don't think that should be put on them. I think that makes them vulnerable. But then if you send a delivery, you get stuck with carnets, delays, haulage. I'm hearing of things stuck for a month. So and this this carnet nightmare, this visa, a visa waiver and an end of having each person having to look to each of the 27 countries. So the EU needs to come together and holistically decide this issue because also equally work goes within Schengen. You, you don't go to France, come back. You might go from France to Germany. I'm talking pre-COVID, pre-Brexit. You you would travel within the, the within Schengen. So you need it needs to be unified there, and I think that's something the EU needs to look to, and Lord Frost and his department need to argue for. Um, and I and, and my understanding is that was offered and rejected, and I'm not quite sure of the politics and the lens on that. But that is something that the sector needs. And equally, looking at carnets, it's a cost. Um, it's a delay risk um, and it's a just-in-time business model so those things don't work together okay so that's the ideal solution if that isn't achievable for one reason or another what would be an acceptable solution so our countries as in fashions countries are probably slightly different to music so it would be Par- it would be france milan lesser extent to spain but growing germany and holland so those five, okay, and Italy, sorry, six. So those would be your countries that we definitely need to sort this out with. I know I've cited Austria. I would say that's less of a, an important territory for the UK fashion industry. But I also would ask then, does a country such as France, which is seeing this as an opportunity to build its its infrastructure and access our talent and our and our workers and our um, our income are they is it is is it in their interest to make this easier and i don't know that it is okay thank you noel if i come to you and ask you the same questions so what would be the ideal solution and then if that isn't achievable what's acceptable uh i would i would only kind of um uh i can i can cover tamara really it's um make it as frictionless as possible uh so the visa waiver bilateral agreements on uh, work permits, take away some of the cost and bureaucracy associated with taking work kit um, uh, between EU member states. Um, and maybe there's something in that if there is going to be some bureaucracy, at least have it at EU level rather than individual member state level. I was talking to somebody the other week who were, they were complaining about this to somebody in government and they said the response was well we've we've looked at what you do and you're well used to this stuff because you've toured the us but the problem is you know that would be like saying going to the us is one thing and then applying for various forms and pieces of paper that actually permit you to do certain activities in each one of the uh uh individual states that you happen to visit or or do some some paid engagement in and it's not the same so um reducing that would be uh immensely helpful. Um, moving on to second, it, in terms of prioritising, look, I think, you know, the government need to seriously engage in the industry because that's not that's not an easy ask because different parts of the industry will have different priorities and even within the industry, you know, so you, if you just took the music, you know, just took the live music bit, you know, rock and pop arguably has a different set of priorities to opera, for example. So, but engage with the industry meaningfully uh, and properly, and not the lip service that we appear to be been paid so far would be a good start. Thank you. Uh, Craig, if I could come to you for my final question. Uh, are there solutions that are entirely within the UK government's gift that we should be giving more attention to and querying more? Oh, you're on mute, Craig, sorry. There's a lot more. I mean, if I can move the conversation on to the movement of vehicles because quite simply no trucks means no tours this is a bold statement as that and in many ways the absence of our ability to actually drive and do multi-stop tours by definition stops tours happening we believe that law frost could go back to europe 
to work with DG Move and follow a plan or, or um, an approach which the car transporter industry does, which is they are actually given an easement to actually do more than three stops in Europe and delivering cars to multiple dealerships. So certain sectors do already have exemptions. And we think the Lord Frost team could build on that. While that is happening, there appear to be two proposals that have been put forward. One is called a reverse easement, where successful British trucks, and this is the DFT advising UK haulage operators to do this, if they have the means to do it, and not all do, is to re-register their trucks in Europe to actually offshore them and then it is in the gift of the Secretary of State, we believe, and it could be done starting September and could actually be available by October to actually allow those freshly minted Irish, Dutch or French trucks, which are actually driven by British and actually are owned by British companies, to come back and operate in the UK. We believe that is entirely in his gift to do that. And we cannot understand why he cannot. The DFT have then also come up with a rather exotic plan, which involves re-registering the truck with French number plates, giving up your British number plate, getting a French number plate, then re-registering that truck back as a French number plate, but with British paperwork. We think this is a complete flim-flam. Now, if it works, fantastic. But it seems that they seem to be grappling at straws. The solution to the problem is to go back and get a cultural exemption for the movement of trucks. Otherwise, touring will stop. And I wouldn't want to be Lord Frost to be remembered as the person who killed international live touring for music, because that is what he's facing at the moment. There's no getting around it. No trucks means no tours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Could, I, could, could I just answer that question just quickly? There are two two aspects which um, we know are in the. They might not be in Lord Frost's gift, but they are in the UK government's gift. One is adding garment workers to the SOL, the shortage occupation list, and one is them stopping their decision to end the VAT, the VAT retail export scheme because that will not support retailers in the UK um, post pandemic with our tourist uh, industry when we've got uh, international tourists who come here and enjoy, have previously enjoyed a tax exemption on their on their luxury buyer so that's something that we've been asking for them to do as well and that's nothing to do with with going to Brussels that is entirely both of those are a UK government decision thank you thank, thank you Tamara Julie Elliott. Thank you, Chair. Um, and can I thank the witnesses for coming in at such short notice as well. And also, I want to place on record my support uh, for the Chair's comments at the beginning of this meeting regarding Lord Frost. I completely agree with them on this issue, um, and I want that placed on record. Can I start by asking Craig and Noel? Um, we had the Secretary of State before the committee a little while ago, and he said to us that some paid touring activities are possible without needing visas or work permits. In 17 out of the 27 states, do you know what he means by some? Um, and is it enough to mitigate the issues you've raised so graphically this afternoon? I'll go to Craig first, then Noel. I, I, I th Thank you. Um, I, I think I said earlier that we broadly can see what the Secretary of State was saying. The problem is the devil's in the detail on visas and work permits, and those terms are often interchangeable, which again leads to even more confusion. We can actually enter into the countries, it's whether we can actually earn a living there. And for the vast majority of them, that is requiring of a work permit. For a fair number of them, it would appear that for short stay working, it is fairly straightforward. So he is correct in that assumption. However, though, when you dig underneath the surface, you realize that some of the countries limit it just to musicians, but then put very onerous requirements on their support crews. So for example, in Spain, which is one country which is often cited, that is our understanding that the musicians for short stay, which is less than five days, will require a C-class visa, which I believe is 113 euro. But if you're a worker, 
it may be, but there's a lot of misunderstanding. It is our understanding as follows, is that you may have to apply for a D class, which costs 232 pounds, plus you have to get a medical certificate, plus you have to get a police acro, which is another 89 pounds for each member. And you have to provide backup, supporting paperwork and so forth. So yes, he's right in some countries, but by definition, again, a tour, you can't always pick the countries that you want to get to without passing through others. In order to pass through others, you may want to be doing shows in them. So it's like a giant jigsaw. Just for well, some it's, it's, to be working it, doesn't actually help. Yeah, so if I can just try and interpret what you what I think you're saying, Craig, is that the, theoretically there is there is ways technically to do certain things, but in the real world they're completely impractical and very expensive. Is that the gist of what you're telling us? Yes, I can give you an example of that. The Monte Verdi Orchestra is booked to play in Spain for three engagements in December. There's around about 70 people touring. They're facing, depending on whether it's a C or a D class, something between 10 and 14,000 pounds of additional costs. They will then lose, they make a loss on that contract. They are now talking with the people who booked them in Spain of who would actually short for that loss. Noel, if I can go to you, what's what's your take on this? Yeah, similar, really. Look, I mean, whether it was accident or design, you know, the state the statement from the Secretary of State gave the impression that of the 27 member states where UK uh, workers were able to go uh, paperwork free, frictionless, uh, work, visit and work, uh, 17 of them can do that and, and that is absolutely not the case is it there are varying degrees of bureaucracy still associated with uh, those 17 member states which he hasn't identified by the way and I did look on a DCMS website so I thought well, that's good so surely when I look at this newly published guidance on the DCMS website those 17 will leap off the page because it will be immediately apparent to me which ones he's talking about and, and that is just simply not the case is it so I think there's a there's a technical statement there, but I think below that lies a load of reality that doesn't quite match up to the expectation. You can do what you did before. That is absolutely not the case. Thanks. And I want to ask you all next, I'll start with Tamara. Assuming there are no EU-wide changes to the movement of creative workers before then, where do you expect the UK's creative industries to be in a year's time? I'll start with Tamara. Thank you, Julie. Um... So by then we'll have hopefully come out of lockdowns. Uh, there's been an economic downturn and you've got a largely freelance economy who, by the way, all of these industries, what they share are people who have gone into something because of a sense of, of drive, of passion, because it's not a job that you go into in the majority because you're ambitious for economic wealth. So you're driven by your career on a really existential level. I anticipate a major drain, brain drain I don't think that a lot of that would necessarily go to the EU because I think for certainly for the fashion professionals, it's easier for them to go to the US because of a shared language and, 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 and it's a bigger market where you can be in one country and you can travel within. I think it is, you've already, I've already also seen a lot of people getting a second passport, that's already happened. So you've got a lot of people that they're here, but they've sorted out a German, Irish, French, whatever passport. Um, so I think there will be more of that. Um, what you're seeing with the brands is they are looking at major hassles with, with paperwork and not a, all of them can have got the capacity to organise um, an EU distribution hub, which is what the government guidance suggests they should do. Um, that money, the, the, the money that was cited for SMEs isn't really fit for purpose when they've rung up. They've had 90 minutes on a call with an advisor to get £2,000 and have given up. Um, they're frustrated, they're tearing their hair out. Um, so I've got, they're saying I'm either going to relocate or if they're, if they're insistent on staying here, they're then adding the hassle of looking at Portugal to do manufacturing for their EU website and then uh, UK manufacturing for a UK website, which is really, really arduous and very problematic. For the larger businesses that have got call centers, they're looking to relocate their call centers. Obviously there's going to be a downward line in 
international language speakers in the UK um, who are on a lower income. It's going to be less attractive for graduates to stay here after they've done their degrees if they do come here um, and, and take those kind of custom jobs customer services jobs, so they're relocating those to the EU. Equally, the jobs in um, distribution are going to the EU because they're taking their haulage to the EU. So again, the lower the lower pay scale jobs are also relocating, which is obviously possibly not what was an intended consequence, but will be an outcome of this. So I think that the brain drain will take times. So people are very emotionally attached to to, to their to the, where they live. And as I said, a lot of people have made living here work for them in spite of the fact that they haven't necessarily made all their money here because they love it here in london especially in manchester and other cities that are, hot, are hotbeds of the uk fashion industry are fantastic places to live um, and you've also seen a lot of people move out of london and the cities as we as i'm sure you have um, due to the pandemic so people are looking at things anyway with a new lens because the pandemic has given that time to reassess and i think that you will see um the higher end level, the kind of like the A star students, the top level will be moving more to America because it's just a bigger market and you've got one visa to deal with. And other people will try the EU and for production, more will go to Portugal. Thank you. Um, Noel, where do you think we'll be in a year without changes? Uh, I worry actually about where we'll, I don't think we'll be there. I think in a year we'll start, see the start of the future if you like. So. Um, I think we'll see more movement of UK-based uh, haulage, UK-based uh, equipment supply. I think you'll see more of that move to the continent, uh, move to the EU. Uh, at the point Craig made earlier, I mean, if you, that's fine for the organisations, but that kit has to be maintained in service. It won't be maintained by uh, UK workers. It'll be done uh, by um, EU workers. I think we'll see a drift away from the industry. I think we have to bear in mind that where we are and what we're coming out of, any resilience has been kind of sucked out and people are struggling. Uh, so on the cusp of kind of recovery, they then get hit with this. I think that undoubtedly means people will leave. Uh, we will suffer uh, skills from the industry, uh, leaving the industry and going somewhere else. And then I think what we'll start to see is the EU begin to recover and kind of consolidate and more bases over there. There might be a short term need for UK uh, technicians and engineers to help train people up. But I think we will see the start of a process. We have warned the government repeatedly, COVID gave us a little bit of time, not very much, but a little bit of time. And they've completely wasted that time. They've wasted it. And I think if we waste any more time and we turn our attention to this in a year or two or three years time, we will be approaching this with a reduced skills base in, in the UK and in the EU, we will be approaching a developing and maturing market that we will struggle to break into. So, you, you know, I think comment was made earlier, what happens over the next couple of months will set the tone for the next five, 10 years. And I think that's absolutely true. Thanks, Craig. Have you got anything to add? Well, I wholeheartedly agree with what Noel just said. Bearing in mind that in contemporary music, 85% of European tours originate in the UK. That means predominantly they have UK staff, UK suppliers, UK trucks, UK buses, UK caterers. So 85%. So yes, it's a very dominant position. I don't think any other industry has such a dominant position. That will be lost. Many suppliers will move offshore. They're already planning to do so. That means they'll then be employing local staff. Many of the very experienced and trained staff by necessity have had to get other work during COVID. There's a very limited incentive for them to return to go into an uncertain future. American acts, when they come over, have far the vast majority of times, fast, fast, I'm saying 85, 90%, if not more, percent of the time, they take on British staff to actually supplement their European tours and they use British equipment. They will start to move to Schiphol, to Frankfurt, to warehouses in the middle of Germany and, and take on the gear there. And all of that will be lost, the rehearsal things will be lost. There's a real danger that orchestras, international orchestras by British orchestras will stop. And that's not just the visa issue, it's to do with cabotage of their own account vehicles because they can't just put their gear 
they're very expensive instruments and delicate instruments into any truck. They have to put it into their own truck. They can't drive it, they can't tour. So you're going to stop the Royal Philharmonic from touring. It's as bold as that. Can I, so, can I just go further and say, if the government secures reciprocal bilateral agreements with the EU, EU member states based on our rules for the movement of creative workers, will that be enough to mitigate the issues you've raised? It would go a very, very long way. Live music revels in the fact that we are entrepreneurial, we are problem solvers. That's what we do. We work to very tight deadlines. The sector is here is to find solutions, but you have to give us a few crumbs and we will work with them. But if we just run against the brick wall, all we're getting at the moment is a flathead. And if I can go to Nolan tomorrow, would you agree with Craig that if the government does get some of these bilateral agreements, it will help? As long as that happens soon, yes, because I, I don't yeah. think the threat it's left too long, but, but yes. When, when would you say it needs to happen by? I know yesterday is the answer, but... Yeah. <laughs> should have, should have, as, as, as soon as possible, should I, I, you know, within the next few months, before the end of the calendar year, we want to see some progress, but yeah, yeah I mean, look, I could say lots about lack of progress and, mm. you know, just, just some urgency on this, you know? I mean, look, for the, for the, for the Secretary of State to announce in May, that um, he had a chance now to look at the full extent of these restrictions, and they vary enormously by country. Well, we were waiting four months for him to tell us what we could have told him four months previous. And this is the, the, the lack of progress. This is, he was told that. Many events, you, this committee have told him that, and yet that's his big announcement. I've looked at it, and it's very, very complicated. And this is May from an agreement signed in December that within days the alarm bells were ringing and phone calls were made and emails were sent. And we get to May and it's just, yeah. So, a yesterday, please. Tomorrow? Um, the, the, the thing for my sector is it, it, it might iron out the issues with services, with people, with talent, but it doesn't iron out the issues with the goods. And I think, I think that um, that issue would remain um, and I speak as someone who's worked in Switzerland where it's been easy to get in and out for, for me as a talent, but it's been less easy for the goods to get in. So you get hit one way or the other. Um, and we are seeing a very varied landscape of delays and added costs. And it seems to be particularly worse coming from Germany, which is where actually the cotton thread from, comes from a company called Gutemann um, for most for most businesses. And although I want to say on record that of course I support onshoring, currently we have one button factory in the UK, zips don't get made in the UK. So unless we had a massive R&D investment into um, raw materials and into um, an onshoring leveled up agenda, which actually addressed these core issues that quite frankly, all our clothes have got bits, belts and zips and buttons on. Um, then that's problematic because these delays are not just um, coming from the EU, they're coming from the countries that we've lost trade deals with as well. So we need to sort, sort this whole thing out. But for us in the fashion industry, the goods issue is as worrying for businesses as the service issue, though I absolutely endorse the problems that are being engendered. And, you know, it is in the majority, the freelancers, because all the SMEs that are being hit the worst. And that for me is heartbreaking because they're the ones that are filling my inbox with the stories. And they've tried dealing with the consultants that um, DIT have got in place and they feel like they're in a rabbit warren of hell when they're already being hit with, with paperwork they can't cope with and escalated costs and delays. And don't forget many businesses over the pandemic when retail units were shut, they moved very successfully really. And I think they should be celebrated for this and to online sales and the EU represented the majority of their sales and that helped them to survive a very challenging year and then boom from January the 1st they've been hit with costs they had to so many people had to close their website or say we can't sell to the EU because they had outraged customers saying I've been hit with extra costs and delays and I and sending it back so those relationships that take ages for someone to nurture have been destroyed by this and I think that's such a tragedy. Thank you very much Chair. Thank you. Uh, Craig you just put your hand up. Yeah can I just just add to the to... Julia asked a question about timing. 
Yeah, just uh, briefly if you can, but thank you. Okay, we understand that, you know, it, it does take time, but, you know, the flim flam has to stop. But in the meantime, the DCMS could really look at providing shortfall funding, short-term funding now, to offset the additional costs of getting visas, the additional costs of carnets, if it can't be negotiated very quickly for them to be removed, to actually give advice lines so the specific cases for young and emerging artists who can't afford professional advice can have access to it. That's entirely in the gift of DCMS to start on Monday. And I actually have been asking for the last three months for them to do that. And they say they're considering it. Thank you. Giles Waffling. Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you uh, all three for coming in today. Uh, really appreciate your attendance, and I think we all agree uh, that things aren't moving fast enough. We all agree that we'd like to see a pan-European settlement rather than dealing with individual member states to make life a lot simpler for everybody. And I actually take uh, uh, Craig's points about carne, cabotage and carnets, etc. And it would appear, I mean, I just want to put this statement to you, and we are we are throwing away business as things stand. I mean, I personally know of broadcasters who've relocated to Frankfurt, for example. Um, would you agree that that is what we're doing as, as things go on and uh, we are starting a hemorrhage? Craig? I think I actually go as far as an avalanche at times. I think when we return after COVID, it will be. Because there's just not enough uh, business within the domestic market to actually support the incredible world-class collection of, of, of musicians, of backstage talent, of designers, of manufacturers, rehearsal facilities. There's just not enough work. So either they will go to Europe, they will give up, or they'll go into bankruptcy. Yeah, and as part of this £116 billion and very fast expanding creative industry, the performing arts sector is absolutely vital for our soft, uh, for our soft power. Uh, Noel, any comments on that? Yeah, just, just to kind of add to that, that um, you know, I spoke earlier about the, the National Theatre, but, you know, look at opera as well, and I'll explain why I'm doing this in a minute. So, I mean, there's three grand opera houses in the UK, there's five major UK uh, opera companies. There's 200 in Europe. 200. Uh, and we've got five. So, you know, for UK talent to sustain itself, we must, they must be able to move through multiple jurisdictions relatively seamlessly, uh, as straightforwardly as possible. Because the point is this, isn't it? There's an ecology here. And the viability and the health of organisations like the National Theatre and like the Royal Opera House, while themselves are individual uh, kind of institutions, they are part of the ecology, which is the creative sector. And, you know, when they suffer, everything suffers. There, there, is, there is so much at stake here. There is so, and I, I agree with the word Avalon. And I think once we see COVID restrictions removed, hopefully soon, once we see that, I think the full scale of the problem here will be laid bare for all to see, and it is going to be horrific. And I would imagine the same's in the same same applies to the fashion industry tomorrow. Yes, I think that you it, look. It's not for want of us telling um, the government officials. I can go back to emails I sent in early two thousand and eighteen where I outlined these issues. I've been saying I've been like a broken record, um, but I think it hints at something deeper which I think is more troubling than that there's a lack of attention or care towards a sector which was growing 11% year on year which adds a lot of value and it and, and although it's important to talk about soft power it's actually hard power because it's jobs it's incomes and it's livelihoods and I think it is very worrying but it also hints at the stem education agenda so the respect that's been put towards the arts has been diminished by an education system where arts has been an add-on or an afterthought in many cases which is worrying and I think that hints at why it's not getting the position of authority that it deserves as, a, as, a, as a, a, such a large employer. And absolutely, you cannot make enough money from the UK market when you've got all this talent. It just doesn't add up. Um, whilst I, um, I'm all for having different trade deals that open up different markets and different territories, we have, we have a massive market that is larger than the American market by a wide margin. 20 miles away, which we share a history, physicality and sensibility with. And it would be ridiculous to overlook that market whilst exploring others. It would be ridiculous to trammel on those pre-existing relationships. You don't work like that in business. Of course, you look at new markets, but you do not decimate the one you're already working with very successfully. It doesn't work. Are. 
we are world leaders. Uh, at yeah. the moment. Let's not throw that away. Okay, good yeah. point, mate. I'd, I'd like to move on to to uh, uh, another subject. Um, so, so the government published guidance uh, and uh, to, to get us all through this, and and uh, I've looked at it, and there's the the the, the tailor, tailored bespoke tailored. You can check the transition self checker. I'm sure you've all had a chance to look at the guidance. Um, how effective do you think it's been? I'll, I'll go to you, Craig, first. Well, I think I said earlier, it's not guidance, it's signposting. You know, for me, a large part of guidance is also about interpretation for informed discussion. To actually say it could happen or this or that. They're just saying, go and look at the Norway website. Oh, I see, yes. So, so, so what more would you like to see? I think they could, they could and we have suggested to them. You know, I've put it in writing to the DCMS and I've raised it on numerous occasions in the cultural workshop group that they could actually look to the industry and recruit experts with industry and fund a resource that could actually help to guide, especially the younger and new to the industry, uh, people who don't have the deep resources to return to, to seek expert advice on specific matters to actually how you get through all the additional bureaucracy. Yeah, and the, and the guidance is there, but I, I, I myself found it fiendishly intricate uh, and quite difficult to follow. But uh, and, uh, and also they're relying on the EU member states to publish accurately. They are not. They, right. they, some, some of them are actually have hardly published anything because they just say we are closed for COVID. They haven't yep. moved on. Some of it is two years old. So Some of it is longer. Down. Yeah. So okay. it, it's very, very patchy. Okay, thanks. Anybody, any, any comments on the guidance? No? Uh, just, just to um, uh, agree. I mean, it seems to me that the, the government spent a lot of money, I would guess, um, are using um, a Deloitte to come up with something that is incorrect and insufficient. Uh, there's many visa companies out that operate in the UK. I'm sure one of those could have done a much better job. Uh, I understand the ISM have written to uh, Alistair Jones, I think, pointing out the inaccuracies where it's incorrect and, and where's information missing. But I'd, I'd agree with that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't describe it as guidance. It's the corralling of various websites and bits of information put onto one page. It is, it's, it's, it's not very good. Right, okay, thank you. Tomorrow, uh, any comments on that? I, I do feel it feels a lot like a cut and paste. So what we do is we get the guidance, we share it. I still get the panicked emails. They can't make sense of it. As I said, when they dig into it and they actually bother to ring the consultants that have been brought in by DIT, they're going around in circles with people who are supposed experts who don't understand the intricacies of the oh, sector. Interesting, no. Tamara. So, so you get the emails. Where do you refer to? Where do you go? Where do you get your sources? What, for my data or for, from them? So Bayes, I find much, much more engaged with the concerns of the sector, I, I have to say, than DCMS. I don't know why, but I find that they're really, they are trying to share data, share information. But as I said, the recent guidance that comes out when you start drilling, dr drilling into it and then you go to the Austrian website and it says you need a degree and a work, what you know, some kind of work qualification that's just not fit for purpose for these kinds of jobs so it's all uh, i think what noel's been saying about had they hired experts uh, all along rather than whoever they've hired it would have made it far easier for the sector because it would have been understanding of the issues that they're facing and unfortunately that these uh, consultants aren't and I think that is put that you know that's not a that's not a necessarily a Brexit issue. I saw this as well with PPE. You have we I, do, I did a lot of calls on PPE, and there were a lot of experts who really didn't understand manufacturing and supply chains, who were consultants on that. And I think it's the same with this. And they were experts. They were hired consultants. They weren't experts. That's the problem. It's the hired consultants who are making the work that determines the lives of the experts. And I don't think that's the right way around. I understand. It's a wonderful irony in that. Thank you very much. Back to you, Thank, Thank you, Charles. You. Kevin Brennan. Thank you, Chair. And thank you very much, Craig, because we've been uh, sort of scratching our heads for many months about how we, as a you know, supposedly important uh, parliamentary select committee, could secure an audience with um, Lord Frost. And, and, and you've told us how it's done now. We just need to get Sir Elton John to, uh, to, 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 to come to the committee as well, and, and Lord Frost will quickly agree to a meeting. Is that right? 
It did so happen that Sir Elton John, we're very fortunate, is a long-term client of our companies. We have a close relationship with him. How long after you asked for a meeting with Lord Frost, along with Elton John, who, by the way, is, is a great, great, uh, you know, uh, treasure of our nation and brilliant songwriter and musician. But how long after Sir Elton's name was mentioned for a meeting did Lord Frost agree to, to meet? Uh, we do owe a debt of gratitude to Lord Strasburger, who was the honest broker who actually set the meeting up ah. and, and attended also. Who is Lord Strasburger? Hello? Yes. Um, Who is Lord Strasburger? Is, uh, do, we need, do we need to contact him to secure a meeting with Lord Frost, do you think, Paul? Uh, I, I wouldn't dare to suggest to the committee how you do your business, but it might not be a bad idea. Okay. Now, you were referring earlier on to um, the, uh, the first meeting of the, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement Partnership Council, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think you did say, you know, that... Uh, uh, this matter didn't feature you know, on their agenda, uh, despite the fact the Prime Minister said this is, uh, uh, we're working flat out to fix it, and the Secretary of State for Culture, uh, Digital Culture, Media and Sports said it was the, the top of his inbox. And I, I've got the, the, the agenda here for yesterday's meeting of the, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement Partnership Council, and there are um, nine items on the agenda. Introduction, welcome Mm -hmm. remarks from the co-chairs, formal adoption of the agenda. Then the first discussion is sanitary and phytosanitary measures mm -hmm. and customs and trade facilitation, fisheries, law enforcement, long-term visa fees, partner, part, participation in union programs, update on institutional framework, including tentative timetable of meetings, par parliamentary partnership assembly, civil society forum, any other business, concluding remarks. Are you shocked that nowhere on that agenda, despite the fact the Prime Minister said we're working flat out to fix it, and the Secretary of State for DCMS said it's at the top of their inbox, that not only uh, is it not at the, the, the top of their inbox, it's not even on the agenda? It's a, it's a source of deep sadness. There's absolutely... To say that people are upset is a mild understatement within our industry. But he goes think, back to. I think the government are taking us all for fools here by, you know, continually making remarks uh, that that this is a, a priority. Uh, you know, signalling to, to, to the to the various industries represented here today uh, that 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 they're really really working flat out to solve it. And yet, on Lord Frost's first meeting yesterday, it's not even on the agenda. It isn't. But then again, if I draw your attention, I'm sure you've seen it to the release that was on the government website of what was covered after the fact. There is one line at the bottom of it, we're saying that the visa arrangements was brought up by the UK government. All um, right, so it was under any other business. Yes. So it was, a, it, was a, it was, it's important enough for somebody to remember it under any other business in the first meeting of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement of Partnership Council. That's what you're telling us, is it? But it reflects though, the, the absence of true engagement, we believe, across the last five months. I think the, officials, seems... the officials of the DCMS have actually been very helpful. But I don't think they actually have the authority or the power to actually drive things through. And so I have great feelings for them because they've actually been, been taking a battering at every meeting with good grace. But in actual fact, it needs minister and I dare say Secretary of State level involvement as a minimum. Well, and we've got a picture here. Yeah, sorry. We've got a picture here, haven't we, of a, a department that, that is apparently, uh, and its officials apparently trying very hard to uh, promote this issue up the agenda, but that have absolutely no influence within government, a government that is uh, um, fragmented and where one part of the government doesn't know what the other's doing or certainly isn't listening to the other part of the government. Is that a fair characterization of your experiences in dealing with the government over the last few months? It has been, and it's been very saddening for officials of the DFT to uh, affirm to us and to with the Road Haulage Association who've been working very closely with, who've been excellent in support for this sector, to um, say that there's no intention at the moment to reopen the TCA in matters to do with cabotage and truck movement. To have that as a bold statement, there's no, there's, 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 there's no in, intention to reopen. 
And do you think that that statement is a reflection of the UK government policy rather than the European Union's position on this matter? Well, we've been petitioning our friends and colleagues throughout Europe who rely on us. We're agents of, of artists, uh, as of many of my colleagues are. We sell artist talent to Europe. Mm -hmm. Those promoters out there really need our talent. Their buildings need our talent. The fans want our talent. So I think as they grow more and more, particularly around the economic argument, because for every pound or every euro spent in the venue, there might be several pounds or euros then spent in the local economy. Yeah. But there'll be a growing, fast growing economic argument and pressure. And that's what we've now been sowing the seeds for as an industry throughout Europe with local concert promoter associations. I'm talking to the European Arena Association, to various theatre organisations across Europe, as indeed the theatre and the opera and the classical world are also all doing. Okay. And that would be the economic argument that would drive the Europeans back. To okay. Can I, can I just ask each of you in turn, and I'll, I'll start with you, Craig, and then come to Tamara and then Noel. Um, is there anything that's improved for your sectors uh, regarding working in the EU over the past five months since um, we left the European Union? And uh, start with you, Craig, then tomorrow. No. Tamara, or Tamara, sorry if I pronounce it correctly, I beg your pardon. That's your welcome. Um, Tamara, um, yeah. no, is the short okay. answer. Thank you. And, and no. No. Well, I appreciate your brevity, everyone, on that, <laughs> on that, on that um, question, and that will be reflected in in the record. We did have an announcement recently, um, Craig, that the government uh, was uh, announcing a trade deal with uh, Liechtenstein, Iceland and Norway. And press reports indicated that UK bands, uh, part of that trade agreement, UK bands would be able to tour freely in Norway, Iceland and Liechtenstein. Now, Leaving aside the fact that in the last decade, not one of the top 10 UK acts has ever played in Liechtenstein, uh, uh, or, or that only uh, Ed Sheeran has played in Iceland on, on two occasions in that decade. Um, I have to say, Sir Elton John is very popular in Norway because he played there 12 times in the last uh, decade, which is far in excess of anybody else. Um, but, but leaving that aside, is there any hope in that, Craig, in that agreement? That if it can be done with those non-EU uh, countries quite quickly and quite easily, I appreciate that some of them are very small countries, that, that, that something similar, if the government put the effort in and had the will, could be agreed with the European Union. I would absolutely agree with that sentiment. You know, we actually, our company actually booked those shows in Norway, so I'm very familiar with the terms of those that... <laughs> those engagements. And indeed, we do book shows into Iceland. The, uh, the published numbers weren't quite right for Iceland. But oh, uh, you're, you're, quite, you're quite right. If it can be done there, why can't it be done across Europe? We're uh, at a loss to understand why. And I think so much of it is because we get a strong feeling there's not an active engagement, active support to actually believe that this is actually a world-beating sector that is facing annihilation. Well, we know they're not taking it seriously because it's not even on the agenda, don't we? So we already have established clearly, in fact, that they're not taking this, this issue seriously. And uh, on the, 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 are you aware, Craig, of the Carry On Touring campaign, which came out of the uh, uh, petition to Parliament by uh, uh, somebody called Tim Brennan, no relation, I, I should make clear, uh, and uh, a letter that they've written, which I think has been signed by over a thousand um, uh, people, <laughs> Uh, to Lord Frost, but which is yet to receive a reply. Now, it was the 26th of May, and we know Lord Frost takes his time in responding to things, but um, are you aware of that campaign, and um, you know what, what would your comments be on, on him not replying to that yet? I am, I'm, I am very familiar with it, and it would actually just highlight the one thing about our industry, even though we're competitors in so many ways, We've actually, because of this, we have really joined up and I've actually spoken to Tim and many others across the whole group of different pressure groups, uh, whether it's We Make Events or many others. Uh, so we're actually very joined up and we agree with each other okay. in, on so many things. Uh, 
Lord Frost needs to respond. Okay, thank you. It's quite simple. Um, Tamara, uh, could, could I, I'll ask each of you again in turn this final question, really, which is, what message do you want Lord Frost to take to the EU? And perhaps in addition to that, what, what would you like us to ask him if and when he finally deigns to appear before us? Well, I think he first of all needs to take the sector seriously. I mean, fishing has become a trigger word, which is no disrespect to the fishing industry as it, as it stands, but the consistent prioritization of an industry that is equivalent to East London's fashion industry um, nationwide with a minimum amount of jobs is politically charged and therefore becomes problematic on a business level and on a workforce level. Um, so I think that the, 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 the absence, as you've highlighted, Kevin, highlights a lack of um, aware, not awareness, because they're certainly aware of us, but a lack of attention. And I think that that, that needs to change. This visa waiver would be something I totally would love. And the um, actually in writing about the carnets um, and also on, on goods um, that were traveling without you, I, I really don't want freelancers stuck at Eurostar with um, overzealous customs officers. I know how daunting it is having been a freelancer. Um, and in terms of that campaign, we signed up to that campaign. I think we were the only fashion industry um, organization that did because I tried to align myself with as many different creative industries campaigns to get fashion on the agenda because quite often it's been overlooked. Yeah. Um, and in terms of DCMS, I would like to be on the steering group. I have asked, I think there's one fashion organization and there's several music and that's not good enough. Okay. Um, that would be my ask. Okay, thank you, Tamara. Um, no. Yeah, look, there's a number of things here. Look, you asked a question about if anything has improved, and I'll give you a very brief answer along with the rest of the, the witnesses. But, you know, if could, could just take a minute to go a little bit further. I'd say things have got worse in terms of how people are viewing this issue. They, they make no mistake, people are furious, as if the issue wasn't bad. So we got off to a bad start, and the government have managed to make the situation worse at every turn. So whether it's an unfulfilled promise, um, whether it's empty words that don't appear to mean anything, whether it's claiming that there's action taking place but no evidence to support that whatsoever, or even if it's the Secretary of State saying things that people told him months ago, almost as if it's a new piece of work that he's, he's managed to uncover, or whether it's more recently. You know, I mean, the whole thing about Iceland, Norway and Liechtenstein, I mean, Liechtenstein in particular, it was just greeted with derision because, and it's not just the issue, because of course, any step forward is helpful, of course. But when you wrap that up with statements calling it um, ambitious and almost heralding it as some kind of huge kind of negotiating triumph, when, you know, Liechtenstein in particular, it's not only landlocked, it's one of two countries on the planet that are double landlocked. So it's landlocked by the country that themselves landlocked. It's got no airport. So to get access to it, you've got to go through other EU or EEA countries. And even when you get there, I'm, I'm sure the good people of Liechtenstein are very nice, but if you put every single citizen in a venue the size of Wembley Stadium, it, it, would, it would still be two thirds empty. So of course, everything, every step forward is helpful, but please stop with these empty words, these heralding of triumphs that aren't actually triumphs, that don't actually make much difference and turn your mind to the things that will make a difference and take it seriously. And I want to make this point as well, if I can. You have got, carry on touring, bet to support that, a number of other campaigns as well with support. You have got on this issue, freelancers, employers, engagers, industry bodies, trade bodies, and trade unions, all speaking with one voice, not to quote uh, the prime minister or to misquote the prime minister, not a jot or tittle between them. That is a unique set of circumstances. And when that happens, that is significant. And maybe it says to you, you've got something wrong. So okay. That, Thank you, Noel. That's very clear. Craig, I'll just give you the last word on that. No, I, I, I think everything has been said. It has been, we feel we've just been ignored. They don't realise that that's how significant we are. And that the other issue is that with because of COVID restrictions, it's too easy to fall into the trap of, oh, they're not working in entertainment. We're planning. And also people are making commercial decisions whether to keep their companies going. Mm -hmm. These are very real and significant risks of major job losses and closures. Thank you. Okay. 
It's real businesses, it's real people, it's real jobs. And mm. you've made that very clear. Back to you, Chair. Thank you. Clive Efford. Can I say to you all before I start that these a lot of the questions that we're asking will cross over um, and uh, you may have uh, given information already that you, so I'm not asking you to repeat yourselves so I won't be offended if you just refer me to what you've said earlier on um, but we'll, we'll just cover the, cover the ground now um, and I also want to associate myself with the opening comments of the chair regarding uh, uh, the, the uh, um, Minister Frost, Lord Frost um, I do find it extraordinary that, uh, as somebody who, who opposed Brexit, and uh, but I accept it's happened, um, but I was told uh, it, 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 constantly in the run-up to Brexit that we were taking back sovereignty, and I do find it strange that having taken back sovereignty to this Parliament, that the government then doesn't want to talk to us and be held accountable by us. It's uh, an extraordinary turn of events, but uh, there we are. I look forward to him appearing before this committee eventually. So, um, can I just turn to you first, uh, 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 Craig? And, uh, and this is a question for all of you. But I'll ask you: uh, In the EU, are, are your counterparts um, um, lobbying their governments um, to work with the UK to resolve this problem, or are they feeling that this is an opportunity that's falling in their laps, and that they really, you know, see this as? Uh, people offshoring now from the UK to Europe, that there's an industry that's going to grow rapidly in Europe at the, at the expense of the UK. Um, uh, you know, what are the problems that they're facing and are they lobbying governments in a similar way to you? Well, deep down, our industry is based on talent. And really at its essence, it's based on creative talent on stage, people writing great music and performing great music. And the UK produces great music. There's no escaping that we are the generators of that talent. So in my business, which is actually being an agent, promoter of talent, the Europeans want our talent. And so they are putting pressure on their governments to get this sorted. But they themselves are overrun by concerns due to COVID because many of them haven't earned one euro in 15 months, 16 months. And there's very few industries that can continue like that. But as Europe opens up, there will be a groundswell of support from purchases of talent out in Europe, festivals, concert halls, uh, promoters, and so forth. Now, I'm, honestly, though, there are certain suppliers who do see it as business opportunity. And what's happening is that the UK government's slowness to respond and lack of commitment is actually opening the door for European companies to take our jobs. Thanks. Can I come to you, Noel, on the technical side of it? I mean, are, the, are your counterparts uh, uh, making the same noises to their governments as you're making to ours? Uh, at, an, at an EU level, yes. So, um, uh, back to, apart from you know, the point Craig makes is that you know, talent is always better through cultural exchange, but coming from a trade union, obviously, we solidarity is an important part of that as well um so for those two reasons yes and it's an open door really but uh, back to uh, uh we have european affiliations uh, to europe-wide uh, trade union bodies and they're on board they're on side one of them appeared at the carry on tour an event recently actually once once we invited them and uh the head of back to my boss philippa charles has signed along with a number of other people uh, a letter directed to um, ursula von der leyen uh, on this issue, so there is there is um, there is pressure being put on on the on the EU side as well. Yes. Okay. Thank, and and uh, Tamara, if I if, if I come to you, can if you, by all means comment on that. But what are your thoughts on the uh, stop the clock visa concession to make it easier for models to to work in London Fashion Week? Has that made an impact? Well, it makes it easier for EU or uh, non-UK models to come here. It doesn't, of course, make it easier for our models to go to the EU. So it seems to have hint that the UK government folded first if this was a poker game. Um, London Fashion Week is 3% of business for Models 1. So I think a focus on London Fashion Week doesn't give the lens of the whole sector within the UK or indeed with our international partners. Um, of course, any 
support that leads towards greater freedom of movement for anybody and it is primarily models who are those people and they generally young people as well let's face it they're teenagers or early 20s girls and young young women and men um, who are obviously going to be terrified of dealing with customs and immigration um, because they're basically our children so of course um, any anything that makes it easier for them the stop the clock uh, concept is great but it seems to be easier for for people coming in rather than us going out and if we're here talking about the uk government they need to support the same they need to be lobbying for that for our talent going out into the eu because that doesn't help us at all and, and, and craig you as you've spoken earlier on about the impact of the, on the haulage industry you know that that the, the, the fact that uh, we have a, just a, such a large portion of the uh, concert uh, haulage industry based here in the uk I think it's the figure is about 85%. Um, can you give any examples that, of where people have relocated already as it started? I mean, I, I know you've, you said it, that it's going to happen in the future unless things change, but has it started already? I think you're on mute. The DFT floated back in February, March uh, for a suggestion that uh, they could drive through this reverse easement. So, to my knowledge, perhaps a half a dozen of the larger haulage, specialist haulage companies have started to um, relocate, or certainly started the process of relocating part of their fleet to uh, EU member states, principally Ireland and Holland, uh, with one or two other places possibly. The problem comes is that across the whole UK fleet, not all of those operators, who again have actually been severely handicapped financially for the past 15, 18 months, have the resources or indeed the energy at the moment to go and start up another business when they're already running a successful business in the UK. The dilemma they face is that if they move their trucks and re-register them and become EU operators, they also have to then get EU uh, driving licenses for their drivers. They have work permit issues, which may or may not be of, of uh, uh, to what extent that will be, no one is really, really clear. And to do all that, and then it may be that the UK government doesn't actually give the reverse easement anyway. So they could be sinking hundreds of thousands of pounds, if not more, into an endeavour, which is a white elephant. And is there... What we seek is clarity. And is there is there an issue? We talked about a haulage, but there, I mean, isn't there a, a huge rig hiring uh, uh, industry here, based here in the UK, for you know the, the actual uh, the, the hardware, the, the all, all the equipment, the lighting, and everything else um, that that is uh, is provided for large tours and hired out, and, uh, and and isn't that largely based here in the UK too? Absolutely, as are the associated technical staff. You know, this is where the industry started, and that could be one reason why we are market leaders. We are really, really good at it. We also speak English, which is very attractive to our American friends when they come over and tour Europe. They can have English-speaking crews. But none of the solutions that have been proposed help the classical industry. Not one of them. Because none of these solutions, apart from a cultural easement for cabotage, actually takes into account own account vehicles and um, craig uh, sorry no um, the, the implications of uh, you know, are, are there examples of where people who with those those skills are basing basing themselves uh, now in, the, in in the eu in order to go overcome these problems uh skills or equipment because the, the skills are UK workers. This, they, are, they are highly skilled, highly experienced, long tradition and history of doing this work and, 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 and that's been explained. The issue will be, uh, so I'm aware of some organisations who have opened up offices. I'm not quite clear whether that's just a brass plate thing or whether that's the prelude to something else further down the track. Uh, and of course that's the worry because once that equipment and or vehicles go offshore, you know, it's the associated maintenance and servicing of that stuff that, that will be done uh, in the EU, not in the UK, and, and that will certainly not be done by uh, by UK workers, because otherwise, what would be the point in all that business upheaval? 
And you said earlier on that you, you need to see some movement on this issue in the next few months, otherwise it could impact for the next five to ten years. Um, do you get any indication at all that the government gets that? No, none whatsoever. In, in, in fact, quite the reverse. You know, I don't, I, look, I said before, people are furious, and they are. Um, apart from a lack of lack of progress, lack of movement, they see a lack of commitment. People genuinely saying they either don't get it and they can't not get it because it's been put on their desk, it's been put in their emails, it's been put in front of them. So it must be that they don't care. Um, uh, so, so, yeah, so the short answer to your question is no. I, I don't see any progress, I don't think anything's changed. Craig? Might I just return to that, that issue of understanding and comprehension of our industry? The thing is, it's all very well to say, we'll go and move half of your fleet over to Holland. But there's also a time issue through the year that at certain times, in summer festival time, you need lots of trucks in Europe for obvious reasons. But perhaps going into the winter, autumn seasons, that you need those trucks back in the UK. So if a decision is made to move trucks to Europe, we might then have the irony of actually not having enough trucks, specialist trucks, specialist drivers, to fulfill our requirements at the high density times of the year. If we don't take trucks as an industry to Europe, there's insufficient um, fallback capacity in Europe to fulfill our tours. So I predict that unless this is resolved, there'll be major tours that are booked, tickets will be sold, and we will not be able to get gear from A to B to fulfill those shows, and that we will lose major tours and small tours and medium-sized tours across all musical forms of expression next summer. And what I'm trying desperately for those involved in government who actually are trying to find solutions to us to actually understand that very basic principle that we work months ahead. Thank, and thanks. there's a problem that will come next summer. That, thanks. And if I can just come to you last, uh, Tamara, you've talked about the problems that the Carney system has, uh, has, has created. Uh, but what does it mean in terms of the industry if things aren't changed? Uh, what does it mean for the, how the industry operates in the future and the implications for jobs? Well, we've got a series of perfect storms. I mean, one aspect of what you've just been asking my colleagues about also relates because what happens historically, I say historically, we're talking the last 20 years, is that a global brand looks to launch into the EU, into Europe, in London. Um, and therefore, that's supported global tourism, travel, all of which are facing a real, have, have obviously been hemorrhaging money over the last year and plus. The loss of that retail export scheme on top of the lack of attractiveness now to do so has an impact. Then you've got uh, the loss of jobs which um, are going to be symptomatic of, de of the unilateral decision to end the VAT retail export scheme. Then you've got the fact that, you know, studying here is going to cost double for an E or more than that for an EU student. They're not going to come. Then they're not, that means they're not going to want to work here. Uh, the, mo the, the aspects to the creatives is uh, so problematic that we're, we're seeing um, a hemorrhaging already of, of talent and model agencies and creatives looking at, you know, at what's going to happen to the talent, which then what all it does in the round and the long and the short of this is it lowers the global reputation and therefore it lowers not only the presence, but also the talent. And what, you know, what I would hate to see is my generation and the generation just under me relocate because they, they, they're like, oh, we can't afford to be here. And it just diminishes what is already a global standing sector because there are other countries where these industries are being taken very seriously beyond the EU, uh, China, uh, Nigeria. There are other countries where there are th uh, there are growing, thriving markets, and they are becoming very attractive to the current talent in this in the UK. But equally, they could mean that in the current map that we have, which has historically been London, uh, New York, London, Paris, Milan, London just is is taken out of the equation quite easily. And I think that's already been a direction of travel for a number of years for some of the businesses. And you know, a lot of the buyers don't even come here to do their buying; they go to Paris. But I can see quite easily that it becomes another territory and London isn't one of that top four. And that would be a tragedy. 
thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Tamara, just on that point uh, regarding uh, London's status or the UK's status, um, it wasn't always so that, that the UK was a really big player in this space. I mean, 20, 30 years ago, uh, we weren't. Is your fear that basically this is going to just turn the clock back, that we're going to go back to a sort of uh, a much more marginal role as a result of not being able to interact in the way that we need to in terms of creatives? Yeah. When I go to the Royal College of Arts graduation show, which I think is next week, so that will be virtual this year, it's so moving. They are ahead on innovation in terms of sustainability, extended producer responsibility, circularity. Honestly, I think that they, I learn, I learn so much from them every time I go. Equally, it was um, the St. Martin's BA graduation show this week. We have amazing talent coming out of the UK education system. And I think that there have been amazing growths and steps in terms of either sustainable brands who are manufacturing here, whether that's denim coming out of Wales or it's avant-garde brands showing at London Fashion Week. And technically what I've seen over my long career is yes, you had the Alexander McQueens and the Hussein Chalayans of a generation ago who were exceptional, but yeah, there could be some shows where you're like, does this really deserve a show? Um, I haven't seen that recently. I've seen amazing talent. Um, either at London Fashion Week or sharing their work across the UK. And I think that there is there is a real risk to that because reputation in an industry that I don't think a lot of people go in to grow an income. It's not a, a classic career that you go into where you know where you're going to be. You have to work really hard for it. Reputation is part of that package. And I think anything that damages reputation makes it less attractive. And once it's less attractive, people relocate. So it's a perfect storm. Thank you. Uh, Tamara Jinjik, uh, Noel McLean and Craig Stanley, thank you very much for your evidence today. That concludes our session. Order, order. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The